Hello, happy Friday. Um, I feel kind of weird wearing an Uber shirt in Portland, uh, but maybe I can make it up, all up to you to remind you that today is actually ice cream day, so make sure to go outside and order ice cream via an Uber later today. Um, so, like I said, my name is Rafik Rikorian. I'm an engineering lead at Uber's Advanced Technology Center based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the talk today is called Hacking Conway's Law. And if I had to choose a subtitle for it, it would be something like, it's not just a code, stupid. Um, so I gave this talk a few months ago uh, where I was talking about re-architecting systems, specifically re-architecting systems on the fly. Uh, and when you get into the world of rebuilding the system, generally it means that shit's hit the fan. Like, it generally means that something's really gone wrong and you want to like, get out of that hell hole, you want to start from the base up, you want to rebuild it. Um, but this is really hard, right? Requirements always change. You get halfway into it and discover that you forgot the other half of what to actually do. It's going to take far longer than you think. And then one of the things I just kind of like noted offhand at the end of my talk was if you're, if you're going to rechange, if you're going to change the way the entire code works, you might as well change how the team works. And I just kind of walked off the stage. Um, and one of the guys looked at me and just like, what? Um, so this talk is about that last comment. Um, so backing up for a second, what I really want to talk about, though, is speed. So by speed, I kind of mean uh, like how fast can we develop our products? How fast can we develop our projects? How fast is our team moving? Can we write more code? Can we write more features? Um, so I'm sure what all of us have experienced at some point writing code is sort of like some kind of time dilation, right? So like when it starts off, everyone's hunky-dory. Things are moving really fast, but then things start just moving a lot slower. They just like really slow to almost a halt as you start going through it. Um, and there are so many corollaries to this, right? Like as code complexity goes up, like software speed goes down or stuff like that. But what it really comes down to, like the one line that you hear from every engineer when you start getting this situation is this code looks like crap. Uh, it means that like we're stuck in a massive hairball of a mess. Uh, there is like they, they tell you things like, the code was never designed to do the kind of things you wanted to do. Um, and the other thing you inevitably end up hearing is sort of like the management chain learns this one word, which turns out to be like the bane of your existence from here on out, which is like velocity is down. Um, and so you hear this like all the time in this world. So this was really apparent in my last job. Uh, if you all remember sometime between 2009 and 2012, like nothing really happened on Twitter. Like we kind of like stayed, that site kind of stayed the same the entire time. In fact, the only time you heard from engineering was basically be like, woohoo, we survived this latest press event that just happened. Um, and this is extremely also the case at my current job. Um, and it's really important in the world where you're trying to build stuff that no one's ever done before. Like when you're sort of like trying to merge the research world with the production world in a lot of ways. Um, wish I could talk more about it. So I'm going to take it off the screen for a second. Um, so going back to speed for a sec. Uh, what, what most technologists do in this situation is they go back to their roots. They're like, we're going to rewrite this code. We're going to rebuild this code. We're going to make it better the next time around. And in fact, Joel Spassky said this really perfectly. I'll leave the screen for one sec. Like, we all just want to get, we all are perfectionists. We're all engineers. We all want to build the best possible thing that we can do. We want it to be correct. So, like, if you give us a problem, we're going to solve it from code. We're going to go rewrite that thing and just make it better to try to get that speed back uh, from, from the team. There's some aside here of, like, most engineers like writing code and not reading code, but maybe that sort of wraps up all in the same situation. Um, and that's the way we traditionally approach this problem. It's like, to get speed, we're going to just try to rebuild the thing. We're going to try to get the team back together again and make it better next time. And the thing that we've all been preaching the last few years, and it's the thing I did in my last job, 
is to sort of go to a microservice world. So this is, this is where I stood in my last job before I took on this challenge. Like this is Twitter, say, 20, 2009, 2010. The thing wasn't scaling. The thing was falling over. It also led us into these really bad developmental problems. It was too hard to write good code in this world. And we spent two years making it look something like this instead. We didn't call it microservices back then, um, but this is what we ended up making it look like. And we all know the pros and cons of doing this, right? Like these are, these are like directly from the Netflix talks about exactly all the pros and cons of why you want to do a microservice versus a monolith. Like you want to have tightly scoped code. You want to have teams or you want to have code that's responsible for one thing. You want to have clear communication boundaries between all of it. So like we're solving it in code. We're trying to get faster. We're trying to get more robust in the code itself. And in fact, like this microservice thing has been so big and we spent so much time talking about it. Like, if you look at just like Google queries over the last couple of years, like this is what it looks like for like microservices over the last few years. And like if you go even to the root service oriented architecture, it goes even crazier. We at OzCon are more guilty of this as well. Like there are all these talks which just have the word microservice in it. So like we're all trying to figure out how do we get speed, reliability, and stuff like that back, but we're just focusing on the technology. So what am I going to do? What, how should we approach this problem? So let's talk about Conway's law for one second. This basically means that your team, your organization, your company is destined to write code in the same way that your team, your organization, your company is organized. However you lay out your team's structure, you will get code in the exact same way. And you need to remember that when you're trying to tackle a problem like re-architecture or you're trying to like rebuild something from the scratch. So let me make this a little more concrete. There's a great quote from ESR. And then if you think about some more, like let's, let, let's set up like, a, like a, a joke. So like you have a database guy, you have a C-sharp guy, and you have a JavaScript guy who walk into a bar. Uh, it turns out like you're going to end up with a, a three-tiered architecture. You're going to have a database, you're going to have a C-sharp, and you're going to have C-sharp as your business tier, and you're going to have JavaScript as your front end tier. And in fact, I guarantee you, if I pulled that C-sharp guy out and you only had two guys left, you'd just end up in a Node.js architecture. So like, like it... I, so your team very much determines it. In fact, there's almost no bearing on whether it's right or wrong. It's just what your team is set up to do. Um, so just the very act of setting up your group is going to dictate what your code is going to, how your code is actually going to go look. If you think about it another way, like from like the, the pointy-haired manager perspective, if I gave you four people to work on the team, you're going to figure out work for all four of those people. But if I gave you three people to work on a team, you'll figure out work for just three people instead. So like taken to the extreme, it's not just like every single team, right? It's like how are these teams talking to each other? How are these teams composed? How do these teams organize across the entire company? So for some examples, there's a great cartoon by Manuel Cornet that I'll put on the screen for once. I'll flip through it. So Amazon, um, this one's the most normal. Google, I, I just love like the crisscross lines. Facebook. The, the thing about this Apple one, which is really great, is like the reach around on the, on the org structure, which is just hilarious. Um, sorry for those of you guys at Microsoft. <laughs> and Oracle may or may not be any worse. <laughs> But like you can totally see, right? Like just think about it for a second. You could totally see the products of those companies being the byproduct of exactly how those companies are organized. So that's the thing I want to talk to you about for one sec. Like how does it apply here? So in this world, like we had one team working in the, our monolithic code base, the Twitter monolithic code base. Now the like, we fooled ourselves in trying to think we actually had multiple teams trying to build different features, but that's all crap. Like, what it really turns out is they have one big team moving in lockstep, trying to ship this code, sort of get it out the door. And when we broke out into this world, if you try to keep one big team working in this world, it's also going to fail. I don't know when it'll fail. You might get your speed back for the short term, but you haven't thought about hacking the team. So it's going to fail eventually, and it's going to fail pretty badly. 
So what do, you, what do I think you should do instead? Or what do I think you should do instead? Sort of break it out into smaller groups. In fact, the way I would like to think about it is everything we love about service-oriented architecture apply to your teams. So you have clearly scoped teams. You have single responsibility. You're independently managed. You have clear ownership. You really want to get into a tightly aligned and loosely coupled kind of world pretty fast. So a few gotchas. Let's talk about those. One is like, you're going to figure out a way, like these teams are going to get entrenched. They're going to like create walls around them. They're going to build everything they want to do. You, to avoid this, you're going to actually want small teams. You're going to want to have, uh, you're going to want to solve architectural problems by understaffing the teams, not overstaffing the teams. You're going to want generalists on these teams. You're going to want like a backend guy who does some JavaScript, a JavaScript guy who does some business logic. You want to just mix it up. Like this statement like reads like a, uh, It'll put you to sleep if you read this statement. This statement is 1968, but what basically saying is you want your agile teams back. You want small agile teams that work really quickly. So if you're hacking your code apart, if you're thinking about how to re-architect it, think about getting to these small agile teams to do all the work. And then if you don't do this, then what happens? Again, I was just saying, like these teams become entrenched. So you think about your web tier, for example. So if you only staff it with web guys, your web tier is going to have like three different JavaScript frameworks in it, all this HTML, CSS. Basically, no one's going to understand it except your web guys. In fact, now we've just done the opposite of like what, what Conway's law was saying. Now, like the architecture has now dictated your teams all of a sudden, probably a little too far. So taking Conway's law and making it more like Yoda speak for a second, what's really going to happen is sort of like the backwards, which is your system design now defines your organization. So it's something to be aware of. It's something to be concerned about. So my advice to all of you, this one sounds like a high school essay, like lessons learned. It's like to solve technical problems. But what it really comes down to is as you as engineering uh, engineers are also engineering leads in your organizations, in your places that you work, whether it be open source or whether it be in a company or a project. And these are things you have to be aware of. I want you to think about stepping out of just code for a second. In order to tackle any big problem, you also need to look at the team that's sort of organized around because that team dictates everything else. It's going to accidentally dictate your architecture. It's going to accidentally dictate how fast you can move because you're going to get these entrenched worlds. So four things so just to take and recap, basically. One is, it's not about the code, stupid. Like, like think about it as a bigger picture. Like, it's, it's the inception moment is just even hiring the first few people or putting the first few people on your project. That's going to dictate the next few years of your life. Small teams can do really big things. Don't overstaff these small groups. If you just have these small teams, creativity will force them to do the right thing, and you won't get stuck in the over-architected world. You might get stuck in the under-architected world, but I would claim that you can move faster in that way. Full tax teams keeps your architecture flexible. Just get all the right people together. Don't just put single purpose experts together. Uh, otherwise, Conway's law will say that that's exactly how the system's gonna look. It's gonna be entrenched there. And then finally, don't fight it. Just work with it. Work with the grain. It's kind of like sanding wood. Like it, it, Conway's Law Survey is more like guiding principle, not the doomsday machine that a lot of us think it is. Okay, that's it. So thanks for your time.